highly refined molecular therapies to be used, they can. Well, that's not. I mean, no, there's I mean, another elephant. In the, Scott, the, there's another elephant in the room here, which is there's a um, lessening of a trust in physicians' ability to prescribe drugs appropriately based on the label. And I don't want to misquote your book, but I think you expressed that too in your book that you don't fully trust doctors. And so the problem is that Dr. Ray Warren and FDA is unwilling to approve drugs for narrow circumstances because they don't trust that physicians are just going to use that drug based on where the data indicates that it's going to have its most beneficial impact. That's a very difficult problem to, to try to solve from a central agency in Washington. Uh, and that is at the root of a lot of these issues that we're talking about here. I think we should put it on the table. But wait, I, I, have to, I simply have to add, your description that the targeted drugs are a rarity is just disconnected from reality. All of the HIV drugs were structure-based structure design. Most, all of the mono, MABs are, are targeted drugs. All monoclonal antibodies are precisely targeted drugs. You know, most of our cancer therapies are on this. They can now go from a genetic uh, identification to a MAB or a structure-based drug in four years licensed, okay? They're doing it here in New York. They just got Zalcor out in four years, gene to active drug targeted. This is not a rarity in the system. This is where the all of medicine is headed. Jerry Horn? This is not a problem. If a company uh, knows that a drug is going to work for a patient with a particular genetic makeup, and they say, let us do a study only in people with that genetic makeup, Herceptin is an example of that in relation to breast cancer, they can bring that to the FDA and say, this is the people we want to test it in. It's a subgroup. The FDA will say, fine, test it in those people. If it works in them, the drug gets approved. That, the yeah, idea that there are these, these, if only that were true. these subgroups <laughs> that are out there that are not well defined and nobody knows who, quite who they are, but maybe it'll benefit somebody, so let's let anyone have access to it, doesn't make sense because it does open the door. Uh, some of my best friends are doctors, but it does open the door to the idea that any doctor and any patient can take any chemical that they think might be helpful and say, let's start using it. And that is the pre thalidomide pre-1906 era that I don't think we want to go back to. Okay, I want to put now to this side the, 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 the subtext of what was the other, your opponents have been arguing all along is that there's been a numbers of cases where uh, an agency, which as they have indicated, may be overly influenced by the industry that they're supposed to regulate, has approved uh, products that have caused exceedingly harmful in very public ways, Fiox, for example, the IED shield. Um, so they're making the case that um, if, if you don't watch very tightly, if you don't test very, very rigorously, people are going to get killed. Can you take that sign well, off? Well, so I read, read Dr. Avon's book. And again, I, if I misquote you, let me know. I don't think that you trust drug companies in that book. You express a mistrust of drug companies. I, I know you don't trust physicians to make nuanced prescribing decisions based on label information. I don't think you think that patients can make fully informed decisions because the information is too hard to interpret. You don't trust FDA, but you want to give them more authority. So my question is, who do you trust? <laughs> Jerry Avon. I trust my wife, who's in the audience. <laughs> um, but, you know, in, Scott, when you, when you put it like that, it does sound like I'm some sort of a, a paranoid geek who really has, you know, fears of everything. I think if we're going to have a regulatory agency, um, you know, I, I don't trust airline pilots if they haven't been, you know, certified as being able to fly a plane. Uh, I think there's a lot of things in society where we do not accept that whatever a person wants to do is okay because they must have good intentions and it'll probably come out okay. Healthcare doesn't work like that. We need to assume that if something is effective, it needs to be demonstrated by the people who want to sell and we're not, it. And we're not arguing for no FDA. We're, 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 the question is, what should the level of evidence be? When should judgment take over when it comes to a disease where there is an available therapy? Yondalus is a, I don't want to be an advertisement for the drug company, a lot of people think it's a very good drug for sarcoma where there's no available therapy. What's the harm in making it available here? Watching it closely, allowing doctors who treat that disease, it's just a small community of physicians who treat that disease to use it. I agree with you that it should be vigilant post-market follow-up. FDA has tools to do that. They can be holding the drug companies accountable and should be. But what's the harm in making it available? Trusting physicians to use it appropriately. Some won't. Many will. Trusting patients to make informed judgments. Some won't. Many will. All right, I want to go to audience questions now, and the way that this will work is if you raise your hand, um, a microphone will be brought down the aisle if, once I call on you. I'll need you to stand up, state your name, hold the microphone about a fist's distance from your mouth so that we can hear uh, you on all of the various broadcasts. Remember to keep it on topic to keep these guys debating on this motion. Uh, before we get to that, I just want to do a little bit of celebrity spotting. Um, uh, three, 
uh, tonight uh, so far. Uh, I want to uh, welcome John Stossel of uh, Fox News. Um, frequent, uh, a, few, a few times a debater on this stage, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Pete Dominic, uh, who has a radio show on uh, uh, Sirius X, XM Sirius, and uh, also on CNN, and is a big fan and supporter of Intelligence Square down the front row. But the real prize, uh, since we've been talking about uh, genetics and the world that uh, has been open to us, we have in the audience, uh, if you remember from reading The Double Helix, um, Watson and Crick uh, in 1953 in the United Kingdom uh, and here um, discovering the structure of DNA. Jim Watson is in the audience with us here. God could not make it tonight, I'm afraid, but uh, we, could, we did pretty well. So let's go to some questions. Uh, sir, right down front, and the microphone's right behind you, and if you stand up and tell us your name, thank you. Hi, my name is Andrew, and I have a question for Mr. Huber. Uh, you mentioned that drugs should be approved without demonstrating clinical outcomes, and, uh, but it seems that there's a risk that if you don't have enough data, you'll end up uh, with drugs that uh, harm more than they help. Uh, and uh, Dr. Avor mentioned the thalidomide case. I was wondering what you would say to the people and the families who would be harmed by a drug that is rushed to market before it's ready and before anybody knows that it's safe or effective. Peter Huber. Well, for the, uh, the first thing I, I would say to them is my, my heart goes out to you. Thalidomide was a terrible tragedy and it involved kids and any parent, and I am one, uh, it just breaks your heart to read this, okay? Uh, I will add that it was a drug from the 1950s and so on, and, I, I w and now I'd, I'd like to tell you the follow-up on thalidomide. This does not excuse anything that was done back then. It wasn't, of course, licensed in the United States, uh, but it was licensed abroad. Um, you know that thalidomide is licensed as a drug in the United States today, you know, and you know it, it was, in fact, it was given accelerated approval uh, through the FDA. It was rushed through and they used the, the, an incredibly clever dodge, whoever, whichever lawyer thought but Peter, of this. I don't, I don't think the thrust of what, the question was about the specifics well, well, just, of thalidomide. Well, it was just as an example. Just a second. The, the, the question is, when you don't understand a thing about what drug, drugs are doing, you make horrendous mistakes, and we've made many in the past, and many of the examples, certainly in Dr. Avorn's book, are about misuse of estrogen, which dates way back decades, and, and uh, diet drugs, which have been used for all sorts of non-medical purposes and so on. You know, I, I, nobody wants tragedies, but the way you don't, I would rather prevent them, you know, than apologize for them and, and regret them. The pharmacoepidemiologists find them out late. The people who look for the biomarkers that, that uh, control how a drug performs find safety biomarkers too. Uh, Dr. Avorn has, gotten, has done important work on liver toxicity with a drug called Resulin. There are biomarkers for liver toxicity. We should be looking whether they're explaining liver toxicity when you try the next Resulin. You get them on the label and you don't prescribe these things. Okay. Let's, let's fix problems, not just lament them. Let's go to another question. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, in the second row, yeah, for sure. Right. That's coming from your left side. If you could stand, please, thanks. I didn't go to your side because I think that questioner was doing your work for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in general, the questions can go to both sides. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mitchell. Um, I wanted to ask this question to the side against the motion. Um, you talked about the FDA's role in protecting broad public health, and I wanted to ask what is the difference or how can you separate public health from the health of those individuals dying from the lack of a fast-tracked drug and how can you say that a person should not be let to try this drug? Are they, be, are they living in the United States by permission of the government? You, just to clarify, you said you were uh, against the motion, but you're actually for no, no, the motion. No, I, I, no, I, I meant uh, you're for to the target motion. the question to the... To, to the, the side against the motion, yes, fine. Okay. Sorry. But the rest was crystal clear. Okay, go ahead. Uh, to, uh, j <laughs> no, no, I, it was. Jerry Avorn. The question is it was actually a great question. Jerry Avorn. Right. The question is based on the premise... Well, there's two aspects. One is the based on the premise that there are all these great drugs out there that the FDA is keeping from people, and I would submit that that fact is simply incorrect. There are not a lot of great drugs out there that are being kept from people that we know work. Now, you raise a second question, which is an interesting philosophical libertarian issue. Should the government ever say to a patient, there's a chemical you want to take, uh, and you're, you have a doctor that you found that wants to give it to you, 
we don't think you should have it because we don't think it's safe or effective. Uh, I think there's a legitimate political difference within, certainly on the stage and in the audience. I believe that we need to have a governmental agency that does say, yeah, you can't have that drug. We don't know if it works. We have a system of drug approvals. It has not been approved. No, you can't have it. And that may be seen as violation of individual freedom, but uh, you know, so is the right to uh, you know go through red lights and a lot of other things that are not in necessarily society's interest. Scott, yeah, I, I